We have now arrived at the last lecture, and herein we will try to discuss everything we didn't have time for in the previous lectures. We will call it the paths we choose. I'd like to go back to the situation we found ourselves in after the experiments with cold fusion and calcium-48 had been carried out. We came to a crossroads and began thinking about what to do next. In a spherical macro-microscopic model, a doubly magic nucleus was predicted for element 114, which has 184 neutrons. Purely microscopic models of the hartree fock bogolyubov theory, along with the relativistic mean field models, state that 184 neutrons indicate a closed neutron shell. But the proton shell is not very well defined. It may be higher. Its specificity lies in the fact that, for example, the 120th element can have a greater shell effect, while the 122nd element can be even greater. I wanted to mention, and we will come to this now, that in these super-heavy nuclei, in contrast to lighter nuclei, the effect of nuclear shells in the presence of a strong Coulomb field is well demonstrated for neutrons, but very unclear for protons. Lead has a neutron shell of 126.9 mega electron volt and an amplitude of approximately 8.5 mega electron volt with 82 protons. Here it is about 8 mega electron volt, and the 184 neutron shell is as strong as that of lead, but the proton shell has a maximum of 3 mega electron volt, maybe even 2.5. In reality, it is not clear. This is what macromicroscopy indicates. As for purely microscopic models, there is no such thing as a proton or neutron shell. There, the problem is solved with the use of a mean field and independent particles. Then the graph becomes clear, the masses of the nuclei, the binding energy of the nucleus, and so on. We are here and are trying to move forward. Then we realize that the cross-section drastically decreases. If this section is 10 picobarn, then the upper limit is around 0.07 or 0.1 picobarn. If we move to the left, which was done recently, we get another nucleus and we can see five successive alpha decays down to element 104. But at this point, the next nucleus already has 0.23 picobarns, which is also a sharp decline. Of course, the most interesting thing would be to move in the direction where one has neutron excess until you reach the neutron shell. Unfortunately, this is a dead end because we have already tried all of the possibilities related to neutron excesses, reactor-produced heavy targets, and calcium-48 particles. There is nowhere else from where to take neutrons. We would have to use radioactive beams, but their intensity is extremely low. Even the most recent accelerator complexes that are being built, such as Ganiu in Darmstadt and Frub in Michigan fall short of the required intensity by five to six orders of magnitude. Therefore, despite its attractiveness, this path is still inaccessible. We shall discuss this in more detail later. Then the question arises, why continue down this path and try to synthesize superheavy elements when faced with so many difficulties, perhaps, like all other elements that have been preserved in nature from the moment of nucleosynthesis, superheavy ones could simply be looked for. Because the process of nucleosynthesis of elements, which took place in our solar system 4.5 billion years ago, may have created other superheavy elements, not only uranium, 
The first question is whether this actually happened. And the second question, if it did happen, then have these isotopes survived all of this time, from the moment of formation to the present day? 